From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hunjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! Showtime. It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Zaxby's. Thanks for listening, folks. If you could, please do rate and review the podcast on iTunes. That's kind of what uh, we are measured on. Uh, it helps my self-esteem when we get those five-star ratings. Corey Clark always feels good about himself because he's pretty much the dude. He spent all day answering your questions over on the Tribal Council. Uh, we're going to do something similar called Renegade Express. But, Corey, you got some gas left in the tank to... Uh, to give us some knowledge and, and some real good informed opinions on things? Well, we'll see. I don't know if how much gas is left. I, I tell you, I did like an hour and 40 minutes of answering questions. And I felt like, you know, that they were nice enough to ask a question on there. I was like, well, I'm going to answer it. Um, and you know me, I, I'm very long-winded. You sure don't won't. know what brevity even means. You don't. So even like a ridiculous like six-word question, like what's it like to carry Aslan or what's it like next um, – to stand that close to Aslan's hair. For me, it would be a six paragraph answer. Right. So I got, I got to get a little better at that. Um, but yeah, that took up a good portion of the day, which was fun. I hope we get to do that again, but I think I got, I think I was, um, I still have some bullets left to fire. Okay. Well, you should have fuel left in the tank. You, I, and Ira and the, uh, the show fells, uh, went to Zaxby's mm-hmm. and, you know, you keep telling me to, you know, broaden my horizons, try new things, get back out there, put my heart out, start dating again. I'm like, I just can't, I just can't. I gotta, right. I gotta do what I want to do and, and, and trust the things that I can trust and know. But you kind of pushed me in the direction of trying something different when we went out there. And I'm not a spicy food guy. I'm just not, but you're like, just try it. What's the worst that's going to happen? Let's just try it. So if you're in Tallahassee listening to this you're lucky because you're in Tallahassee, you're in God's country, home of Florida State University, capital city of the third largest state in our great union. But apparently they are testing this sandwich. It's the Southern Spicy TLC. It's exactly what you think a TLC would stand for, tomato, lettuce, and chicken. Dude, and it's got the – and I'm not a tomato guy. I don't like raw tomato. Like I like – I can drink V8. I can eat pizza, but I don't like raw tomato. But dude, that sandwich was solid. It was really good. Thank you it for was, thank and, you for pushing uh, me off the ledge. For the dear listener, uh, Aslan and I actually split it. So you had one half, and I had I the other. That's what it means to split a sandwich. Correct. And uh, yeah, we both liked it. And neither one of us are real spicy guys. Yeah. But the lettuce and the tomato with the spicy chicken, and it, look, it's not like crazy spicy. No, it's not. It's not going to make you run to the bathroom and puke. It's a normal amount of spicy, but it is really good. It's really good. Like, you know, I, I've, I've, I've talked a bunch about my, my fondness for the Cobb salad. I get that a lot. It's actually some, that's my go-to. Mm-hmm. But this bad boy, number one, it's a, I guess it's a test sandwich. But that, boy, that bad boy needs to be on the, on the menu because it's really, really good. And uh, we know for sure it's going to be on the menu for at least the next few weeks right. at local Zaxby's in Tallahassee, folks. So if you're listening to this, go try it. You're not going to regret it. It really is a good sandwich. Yeah, for, check it out. Legitimately, it's a it's a really good sandwich from two guys that don't like spicy that much. <laughs> that thing was really tasty. <laughs> it was, man. There are seven locations in Tallahassee at Zaxby's. Uh, check them all out and help the people that help us because it's a great thing that we got going on here. And also if you're in Marianne and Thomasville and Douglas – that's our guy too. We like him a lot. <laughs> yep, Support go him. There. He's yep. the dude. But he won't be able to get the sandwich there. But still, you know, if, if you're in the area, stop by and get those. All right. So we've got Renegade Express to get to. Uh, questions from the folks. There's a couple questions that we didn't get to last week because I don't properly exit out of the thread and whatnot. Uh, so we'll get to those. We'll also get. We'll take a couple calls. But before we dive into that, uh, dude, what is going on with Terrence Mann? Our guy just signed a contract. For like six mm-hmm. million American dollars, two years of it's guaranteed. What like you can do that? Like you can ball out that well in a summer league that a team decides second round pick. Yeah, man, we like you. We want to keep you around. I get. I mean, it just yeah, happened. Yeah, that was uh, that was really cool. So for the people that don't know, typically in the NBA, not typically, this is how it is. When you get drafted in the first round, 
you're slotted with a certain um, a number that you're going to get paid. So Cabin Gelly, there's nothing his agent can do. In fact, I don't. I'm I'm not almost positive. I am positive that Cabin Gelly's agent doesn't get a dime from his rookie contract because he can't negotiate anything. It's set what he's going to make. First rounders have that. They get a set, you know, whatever it is, one point four million dollars a year. He gets a set contract he's going to make for the next three years, and it's all guaranteed. Well, second rounders get none of that. If you're the difference between pick thirty and pick thirty one, is a whole bunch of guaranteed money. So Terrence Mann being picked, what was he, 45th or 48th by the Clippers, you know, the second round, it's awesome that he got drafted. Only 60 people get drafted. But there was no guarantee when he got drafted that he would ever really be paid a dime by the Clippers. But in three or four games in the Summer League, apparently he was so good that they decided, you know what, we're going to give this guy two years of a guaranteed contract. I mean, it's all, and it's not even like the, uh, oh, I can't remember what they call it. It's the two-way player. So like, they have this contract deal in the NBA where if you get if you're on the NBA roster, you get the NBA minimum. But if you go to the G League, you get the G League minimum. That's called a two way player. Depending on where you are, that's what you're getting paid. Terrence Mann's not even a two way guy. He's just getting the straight two year NBA minimum. You know the the guaranteed contract. Like he's guaranteed now of making a million dollars this next year, no matter what happens. It's just awesome. He he. And now number one, he has been that good in the summer league. But I don't know that they would make a decision like that just based on four games in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I think they had a hint that they were going to do that anyway. They had an inkling that this was a guy they really wanted on their roster. They wanted to be a part of his, their franchise. And then you see what he does. It was like validation. Mm -hmm. What they thought he was was validated. And then now, yeah, man, it's it's just awesome. Like He's going to be paid. He's going to be an NBA uh, NBA salaried player for at least the next two years and maybe the next 10 years. But yes, he's been awesome. I don't know that it's just strictly what he's done in the summer league that netted that deal, but holy moly, he's been really good. So is Cabin Gelly, by the way, but he's been really good. He's running the point. He's six, seven. He, he's like the third leading rebounder in the whole summer league. He's averaging like 11 and a half rebounds per game, man. It's just really cool to see. And maybe his game, like we all know what Terrence Mann is. We saw him for four years. We know what he is, and he's he's one of those guys that does everything, doesn't show up in the box score maybe as much as a guy that averages 20 a game, but he does all the little things that win game. But maybe in a kind of an up-and-down, up-tempo, spread-the-court type of game like the NBA is compared to college, he's going to really shine, and that's just going to be enhanced because, man, he's just – he as good as we all know he is, when you watch these summer league games – he he even looks better than that. Like he he's almost unrecognizable how good he is and how much in control of the game he is from a point guard standpoint. We never saw that. I mean, oh, I knew yeah. he could handle the ball. I knew he was a good passer. I didn't know this was in his arsenal. I'm saying. Well, now he looks like doing? a guy that could be like Draymond. Yeah, what were we doing? What were we doing, Ham? Ham? Just kidding. Yeah, I mean, really, right? 48th overall, uh, 48th pick um, overall, second rounder, just to uh, get the uh, the right number out there. But no, truly, like a great success story for Ham too to show, like, and to the fans who are selfish, I'm included, that we hate when we see guys leave early. Uh, you know, you always, I don't know, I just always want the kids to stay. It's selfish. I understand they got to go and do what's best for them, but to see him, and not that he really had the opportunity. I mean, I think if Terrence Mann were to, if he were to try to leave after last season, he's yeah, he's lucky to maybe be a two-way player uh, or you know back have a back and forth contract between the G League and, and the uh, NBA. Uh, but to see it work out so well so soon uh, is fantastic, and it's just a, a testament, and it's got to help on the recruiting trail for Ham to to keep pulling in more guys, keep putting guys into uh, into the NBA. So uh, congrats to Terrence. Uh, Fiondo will be there as well, and uh, Kawhi, and they'll all get to hang out with Corey when they come to Atlanta, along with Sweet Lou. It'll be it'll be a good time. I'm jealous. It is going to be now. a good time. And I, 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 I'm really interested now in what Terrence Mann is going to be. Like, look, he's still got to work on his shot. We get it. Um, I love that, man, by the way. I love, like, the end. Is there anything that's more ridiculous than scouting reports on guys? Like, you watch the draft, and a guy goes 11th overall. Great athleticism, rangy, fantastic defensively. Got to work on a shot. Like, it, right. it, I just love how it's, I mean, like, in football, be a quarterback – well, you know, he's really got to work on his accuracy and his decision making. We're going to take him fifth overall. Like, ah, like, eh. 
But I get it. I mean, it's just it's just part of Well and, and man is a different deal because he could not shoot when he arrived. Much like Trent Forrest, like kind of similar paths. I mean, um he was never a great he was never a volume shooter. Like Cabin Gelly, you wouldn't say needs to work on his shot. Like he's got a nice shot. A really nice shot for a six ten, six eleven kid. Now he needs to keep improving in every aspect of his game. But Terrence Mann, the one thing he doesn't really have is an outside presence. It's not something he feels comfortable doing. It's not something, uh, quite frankly, he's even done all that well in the summer league. He can knock down an open baseline three, which is a big deal, but he's not a guy six seven. Most of the guys that are six seven in the NBA can shoot from outside the three point line. That's what he's got to add to his game. But holy moly, everything else is there, and you can work with that. And when you have a really good shooting coach, which you have to assume every NBA team has, they assume they're going to get him better at that. But the other stuff he does, you can't teach and you can't coach. The instincts, the uh, the energy, the motor, all that stuff that we all know about Terrence Mann, apparently, obviously, the Clippers really like about the guy. And he could – I mean, you look at him, he could have – he could have a 10-year NBA career. I know I'm getting way ahead of myself. It's, Dude, it's four games in July in Vegas. None of these matter, really. Um, they're not really keeping score. They, none of these really impact the season. But he's really proven that that not only does he belong, but, man, maybe in a year or two, maybe this year. Who knows? Because he's an older guy, obviously. He's 22 coming in the league. Maybe he'll have a chance to actually work himself into the rotation just as an energy guy and a guy that guards and can handle the ball. Just really cool to see, man. And you're right. It's awesome for Leonard Hamilton because now they got, like we talked about last week, they got five or six guys now dancing around in the NBA. People notice that. Recruits notice that. Florida State gets you to the NBA just as well as any other program. You know what I mean? Like that, the, you, You're not going to go to Florida State and be hidden. They'll find you. And you got a guy like Kevin Gelly who was nobody – literally nobody before Florida State got to him and he came here redshirted, then he grew into a really good player. And Terrence Mann, who was a four-year player, you also got Jonathan Isaac, who was a one-year, one-and-done, and a Malik Beasley, who was a one-and-done, and a Bacon, who was a two-and-done. So you got all these guys that, like, you can get there, you can get to the NBA a number of different avenues if you come to Florida State. And I think that's a that's a good selling point, man. I, I just, you know, obviously when they see Terrence and Cabin Gelly hoisting up that, Larry O'Brien Trophy oh, yeah. in June. Yeah. I mm. think that's what it's called. I'm not 100% you're right. You're sure. Right. You're right. Trust your instincts, man. You're okay, right. Okay, good. I wasn't quite sure. It's not the David Stern Trophy. It's not. So when they're hoisting Yet. that up in June, that's just going to be more great recruiting uh, ammo for, for Leonard Hamilton and company on the on the trail. Yeah. All right, man. Well, let's move along. I don't have a good segue. It's uh, well that's after fine. midnight, and we're going to be here for a while. So uh, oh, onward. Boy. Let's get to the questions that we missed last week. I actually uh, responded to them in the written word, but you can maybe add or uh, enhance my answers. Marnol55 said, wake up. Hey, guys, while doing yard work for the past week, I've re-listened to all of the podcasts of the day after our games. Week after week, you guys complained about the same things from week one to week 12. Nothing ever changed. My question, why should we feel like this season will be any different? And I know I think somebody asked a similar question during the Corey Clark Q&A on the Tribal Council. Use the promo code WarChant30. I feel like it was the exact same question. Okay, well, then you probably already answered it. What I told him on uh, the Tribal Council, which I typed out, was Kendall Bryles. Strength of schedule and a quarterback who can demand more accountability, a quarterback who will probably throw it to Maury and Terry more frequently. I also refuse to believe the talent on the offensive line was the worst in Power 5. Browls knows how to call plays. Clements knows how to block them up and how they need to be blocked up. They'll also probably be able to get Cam a better feel of how to run from the shotgun, things of that nature. I don't have a strong feeling of optimism on the defensive side of the ball, though. If you want to add anything, yeah, to I that, mean, I Corey. agree with that. I think the the main the the biggest change obviously has been on the offensive side of the ball, and I think you you look at Bryles and Clements, and those guys have a track record, a proven track record. Walt Bell didn't have that. Greg Fry is a proven O line coach, but he's not proven with Walt Bell and Willie Taggart. Well, Willie Taggart's bowing out; he's stepping away to an extent, and you got Bryles and Clements as your as as the main guys on your offense, along with uh along with our man uh, Dugans. So you've got Three guys that are, to me anyway, significant upgrades. Not because Greg Fry doesn't know what he's doing, but for whatever reason, there was no cohesion yeah. with him and Walt Bell and Willie Taggart. That's obvious. We all saw the product of that every Saturday. These two guys, Browns and Clements, have known each other forever, and they know how to work together. So you have to assume that it's just going to be a better product. So for that 
alone, just those hires, those three, those three different guys, I think should get you a little more excited about um, this season heading into last season. I just think they're going to be better coached on that side of the ball. They're going to be more on the same page on that side of the ball. Coaching. Defense, yeah, chemistry. we'll see. Yeah, coaching chemistry. Uh, J.D. D.A. Knoll, if Blackman is beat out by Hornibrook this fall, do you think he will transfer in 2020? I like James. Hopefully he's our starter, but I don't see him staying. Who would be our starter for 2020? I replied, you'd assume as much. Uh, I'd imagine Jordan Travis. But as Taggart keeps striving for simplicity, I think Jeff Sims could have a reasonable chance to start if he blossoms in his senior season at Sandalwood. All that said, I don't see Blackman squandering his shot this summer. Yeah, I mean, again, I would just be surprised if Blackman doesn't win the job. That doesn't mean that I would be stunned. I just think Blackman's a better quarterback than Hornybrook. I watched Hornybrook more than I probably needed to. For some reason, I watched a few Wisconsin games when he was a quarterback. I was just never overly impressed. Now, this is a different offense than handing it off 45 times a game like he did at Wisconsin. Maybe he just completely absorbs himself into this system and is awesome at it. It's just like a, a perfect fit. But I just think Blackman's probably a little bit better of a quarterback. And so I guess if he got – I don't know, man. Why would he transfer after this season? Well, if he lost like the he job would, again. Hornybrook's a senior. So even if he got beat out, Blackman, you would think, would still if he stuck or if he sticks around in the fall – you would think he'd stick around in the spring and then be the quarterback next season because who's going to be his competition next year? Well, Jordan Travis, uh, Jeff Sims. I don't know, man. Some certain point, you can't keep getting passed over like this. You know, I mean, the, it, it's one thing if you lost the job to Jameis Winston and uh, Christian Ponder, but like to lose a job to DeAndre Francois and then Alex Hornibrook. I don't know. I mean, no, then, I mean, I get it. I just, I, it would be weird because where would he transfer that he'd be guaranteed of being the starter there? Maybe he dropped down. Maybe. You well, know, yeah, I mean, if he's well, if he'd want to do that, I mean, that's a that's a decision all guys have to make. I think Laura, this is a hypothetical that I don't think is going to end up yeah. taking place. Yeah, agreed. But yeah. I would just be surprised if you'd rather go play it like uh, I don't know Valdosta State as opposed to stick it out one more year and be the Florida State quarterback. Yeah. But you, or, or you could just be like, screw these coaches; they don't believe in me. Yep. They never will believe in me. Yep. I'm going somewhere where they appreciate me. I could understand that sentiment too. I just would be surprised if Blackman had that reaction if he got beat out. Yeah. Okay, let's take a, a phone call. Let's go to the caller. All right. 850-792-5730. Hello, this is a true Tar Heel Raider up here in Marineland, Jacksonville, North Carolina. I'm going to try to keep this really short. So I noticed that uh, as far as Coach Taggart is concerned, that there seems to be a, a divide. My question is this. Um, a lot of my friends that are Florida State fans, uh, are black and they love Willie Taggart and say he needs time to turn around. Now the other half, of my friends, the, I mean they're Caucasian, they're white, whatever you want to call it, uh, and they think that he is a complete abject failure and should be removed like yesterday. So I don't want to be that guy, but I guess I'm gonna be that guy. Is there kind of a racial split as far as the demographic of who takes Willie Taggart's side and who doesn't? Um, I don't mean to sound racist, and I'm sorry if it comes across that way. That's not what I'm trying to get at here, but it kind of is as well, if that makes sense. Um, I'm just curious to know if the supporters are mainly uh, supporting Willie because he's black, because I'll be honest, that's why I started listening to your show. It's because you guys hired Willie Taggart, and I really liked him as a coach. Um, and I want to see, I do want to see a black coach make it as a black American um, and Puerto Rican, but as a minority American, I want to see a black a minority make it. Uh, so I'm sorry this ended up being longer than I thought, but yeah, I, I'm just curious to know your answer on that. Thanks. Have a oh, I think I cut him off. Sorry about that, true Tar Heel Raider. Uh, I'll defer to the gentleman from Georgia. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, uh, uh, this is we should. I, I literally want to have a whole episode devoted to this because I think it's mm -hmm. really it it you can't really do it justice or speak to it in an intelligent manner in a three minute sort of Q and A or back and forth. I mean, just me personally, like I. I realize that racism and race plays still a part in most everything that touches American society. I think to act like it doesn't is foolish. Um, read the news. Um, I mean, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to get too far into it. I know people listen to this for the sports and entertainment aspect of it, but I, I definitely am aware and cognizant of how uh, attitudes, stereotypes, uh, institutions, and and laws that have been in the books have, have created the environment that we live in now. 
Um, but to the point that there's a, a big divide, I think most people do realize that are saying that, yeah, he's going to need some time to get this figured out. My brother, when I was down for the 4th of July, I was trying to pick my brain on things. I don't like to talk to him too much about the team because he's totally anti-Jimbo. And then, you know, we get into arguments and it's not good to argue with your brother when you only see him three or four times a year. But there's, you just, I can't worry about, of let, let's say this, Corey, there's, I would think that legitimately only 10% of this fan base is totally done and over and think that Taggart should have been fired after one year. Does that number sound low, high, or about right? Like 10% were just like, fire him, over, now. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a little high. I think there's, I don't even okay, think okay, there's okay. 10%. Okay, I don't think there's 10% that think he needs to be fired now. I think there's, I think the real percentage that you're asking is who's, Who's really dubious? Yes, well, that's what I'm trying. This was a bad hire, and that it's going to end up no, spinning no, no, no. out of control. No, no, that's no. the bigger percentage. What I'm trying to say is, I think there's a very small percent of this fan base that was get rid of him after one year. Like I did not feel good about the direction of the program. I did not like what I see in year one. No one could have liked what they saw in year one. It has nothing to do with the color of his skin. It has everything to do with not being able to line up guys in the right formations, not hiring the right coaches. Um, you know, not w- utilizing your roster the best way that you can, um, not starting your best defensive player. Like, what do we? Why wasn't Marvin Wilson starting? I mean, it, it, those are the sort of things. I don't. I don't care what color you are, but th- of that ten percent that's kind of erratic and just want to get rid of him after one year. I think that's a very small piece of the pie. To Corey's point, that even might be too big of a number. But then within that number, I think there's. Five percent within that small pie that are just out and out ridiculous racist people, and I can't worry about those people. And I think that's such a. I mean, I'm sure that that's what I think it is. I think it's a very small part. They're out there. They exist. Unfortunately, we saw it on Facebook. We saw that ridiculous meme that guy posted that he's got no friends. Everybody turned on him, obviously, and was like, "Listen, you know, they they posted that and and showed everybody just how ugly of a guy that man was." That's so I think it's it's such a small faction that I you can't you can't reach out to people that are that lost in the year 2019. But to sit here and say that the criticism of of Willie or people want him to fail is because he's black. I don't know. I, and I'm not a naive person, man. I'm not. I'm cognizant of what goes on in our country. I don't think that's the fact. I mean, this was the worst Florida State football team in what 35 years. I mean, the bull streaks got snapped. To Florida, no less, at home. Like these things, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, it, it, it just, I don't think, it doesn't. It, it was so bad last year that that's why there's so much apathy and there was just so much dissatisfaction. There are a small part of the fan base that unfortunately cling to things that are as ugly as racism in their thought process. They exist. It is unfortunate. It absolutely sucks. It's 2019. These people exist. Fortunately, they don't speak for the Florida State fan base. They are in no way, I think, representative at all of the Florida State fan base. They have absolutely no clout or pull when it comes to the actual university that is Florida State University or any of the decision-making apparatus. Uh, these people are so far gone, so far away from the world that we have we have moved forward and created and lived in now that I'm just not going to sit here and, and pay mind. I understand, again, that they exist but they don't, they don't speak, they don't move the needle, they don't steer the direction and the minds and thoughts uh, of the people that listen to this show and that pack that stadium by and large. Can't speak for them, can't change their mind, don't care for them. Yeah, man, it's, it, it's just such a hard topic to tackle, especially as a, uh, as a, as a white person, as a Caucasian, as our, as our caller said. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to that. I, I can't speak to the, the fans that, that view him through a certain prism because of the color of his skin. There are people that do that. I'm certainly not naive enough to think that there aren't, like you said. And, you know, Tallahassee is, you know, kind of southern Alabama. So there is that element. Um, it's it's closer in Alabama than it is to Miami um, or Orlando. So there is that element. I get it. Um, it's just hard to know. The guy went five and seven. If he had gone nine and three, yeah. And people were out to, and people were saying he needs to be fired, or he doesn't know what he's doing, or he's not an X's and O's coach. You know, there's so many subtle forms of racism 
that it's hard to even get into. You know, is, is Willie an X's and O's coach? You get that all the time. Just like Leonard Hamilton. Leonard Hamilton, he can't coach. I don't know. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from fans that all Leonard does is roll a basketball out there, and he's got great athletes. Yeah, really? He's got better athletes than North Carolina or Georgia Tech or Virginia or Virginia Tech or uh, Duke. Like, they all have great athletes. It's ACC basketball. D don't diminish what Leonard Hamilton has done and say he just rolls the ball out there and he he gets athletic guys. That's That's preposterous. There's a certain element of every fan base that's like that. But, you know, it's like you said, it's five and seven. In a bad I five and seven, like a really bad five and seven. Five, it wasn't even a you good know? five and seven. Not that there ever would be a good five and seven, but it was a really ugly five and seven. We'll see this year what happens. Yeah. Now, again, you're, you're talking about a university that had a, a, a basketball coach, an African-American head coach, who went his first six years without making the NCAA tournament. They stuck with him. Then he went four in a row. Then he didn't go four years in a row, and they still stuck with him. And now they've been back three years in a row. So whether you're looking at the administration, which is quite frankly the only thing that really matters, and the administration has proven, now I know it's different people in charge, some of it, that, that do, the skin color doesn't really matter. So, the, you know, they stuck with Leonard. He'd been there for 17 years now, which is incredible to think about. 17 or 18 years, whatever it's been for Leonard. It's just... Like, I think, you know, you have the things about, okay, is he a, he's a player's coach and the, and, and the things you have to deal with with that, with quote-unquote player's coach. But, man, he's not a player's coach, quote-unquote, in that sense. Like, he is a hard ass. He will get on those guys. He was not – they did not do a good job last year. The whole coaching staff did, and Willie Taggart too, and he's admitted as much. That was not a good year for Willie Taggart. But it was it was five and seven. I just don't know how you how we go about deciding if a fan base has given up on someone because of the color of his skin, which I don't think happened. I think when you look back at how excited this fan base was when he was hired, and I think by and large, both yes. of both of us would agree that it was a very excited fan base. The and he is such a game. genuine person. Look how, many, look how many people turned out for the spring game. Everybody believed. 100 And the, he did the lap around the stadium. Yeah. And it was a great, it was the greatest moment in Florida State spring game history, probably. It was just electric. And they were all in love with Willie Taggart. And I think what it comes down to is, I think, you know, and again, I, it's, it's impossible. These are impossible questions for me. I just feel completely, I, I'm not, I'm not able to answer these questions. I'm a 44-year-old white guy. I know I grew up in Georgia, but I'm a 44-year-old white guy. It is hard to answer for other people. Right. And I think African American people might look and see how quickly the fan base turned on floor on Willie Taggart and think, okay, there's an element of racism in there. And sure there's an element of racism in there, but is it racist? If it, is it racist to think that he can't do the job after one season? Well, okay, I can I can understand that viewpoint to an extent, but you also have to understand it's a fan base that had been to a bowl for four straight decades. They had never experienced a losing season. So, again, you look at that and say, if that had been Jimbo Fisher who had stuck around and had gone five and seven, they would be just as mad at him, I think. Or if it had been uh, whoever, Scott Frost. If Scott Frost had taken the job and gone five and seven, I don't know that the the – uh, whatever you the the way Climate people feel about this program, program right now, the apathy, right. the worry, um, the negativity. I don't know that it would be any different if Scott Frost yeah, was the head coach. You'd be worried that he was in over his head. I can't speak for that, man. I it, it might be. Well, you'd be. I think I, I'd be worried. I'd be worried if Scott Frost did the same thing. I'd be like, man, maybe he's in over his head. This isn't the AAC. You know, that UCF is one thing. Maybe he's not ready to coach real big time football. You know, but, you know, we could talk about this forever and, and not. It's hard. It's a hard yeah. and it's just a hard topic. Um, it's just a hard topic to talk about. I do understand there has never been an African-American head coach that's won a national championship. Yeah. That means a lot to Willie Taggart. He wants to be that person. And I can understand how it would mean a lot to African-Americans overall to finally in, in a sport that, quite frankly, is dominated by African-Americans on the field to finally have someone a head coaching that wins a championship. So there, I understand rooting for Willie Taggart, but Absolutely. I also think that Absolutely. most Florida State fans, the vast, vast, vast majority of Florida State fans, are also rooting for Willie Taggart. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well but said. hey, we're we're not dumb enough to know 
to think that there aren't any out there that think he's in over his head. He can't do it. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. We know there are fans out there that think that. I see idiots that, that form burner Twitter accounts that pull random photos of African-American guys and then talk crap about Willie and, and try to act like oh, it's it's ridiculous. It's like, hey, man, you know, take the cloak off. I see I see what you're trying to do there. Uh, but anywho, uh, let's transition to something else. Uh, well said, Corey. Uh, sorry to put you Not in the, really, uh, the lines. Not really, but I tried. Hey, sorry to put you in the lines then at this late. See, this is the problem. Like, if we were talking about this at 6 p.m., I'd have a lot more gusto in me, but it's like late at night. I'm just kind of like rocking myself to sleep here. But um, I feel good about the way we talked about a very uh, complicated subject. Uh, let's get back to the questions. Maxwell Gibbs, he's in New York City, New York. You all know that. He tells us all to wake up. That's what Corey still owes everyone. <laughs> Which, by the way, Corey, you're not, you still do. And I've, I, I've, I have a bad feeling you're going to keep kicking this can down the, the street. And you're never going to do it. You got to do no it. Kids. Come, You did hour number two. You can't do just wake up. You started will, it. I, you originated I'll it. it. I'll do it in Charlotte. How about that? You're not going to do it in Charlotte. It's going to be so loud. And there's going to be all these people watching. You're going to feel totally self-conscious. If you can't well, do it like in the, the comfort. Today show. We're not going to have an audience. I'll do it in Char- I'll do it in Charlotte. All right. That's right. my promise to you, the listener. Okay. Hope you gents are enjoying some downtime until fall camp starts. What are your thoughts on ESPN's FPI projecting FSU to go 10-2 and two this fall? It's the same data that this brain and, and Corey's brain said that Florida State was going to go 10-2 and two last year. You, you just know what Florida State is. You assume what Florida State is going to be just in terms of talent matched up against the other talent in the ACC. And you look at that schedule, and yeah, why should Florida State lose to Virginia? It's at Virginia. Virginia's a good team, but still, it's Florida State. The brand carries on. It's Syracuse. Yeah, Syracuse embarrassed them last year, but it's Syracuse. It's in Tallahassee this year. It's NC State. They humiliated them last year. But it's, you know, you look at all those games, and you're like, okay, Florida State should be better than they were last year. They should be just as good, and it's at home. Why not give it to Florida State? And then the two games I have them losing are the games that I think are pretty much stone-cold locks for them to lose, which are at Clemson and at Florida. I take no joy in saying that. Everybody chill out. I don't want to lose to Florida. I hate losing to Florida. But I have a hard time believing Florida State's going to walk into Gainesville and beat Florida. Sorry. That's how I feel right now. It's July 11th. Things can change. I understand. But when you do the whole, well, you got to throw the records out the, the window and talk about a rivalry game, you know who says that? The team that's going to lose the game probably. So I don't want to go there right now. But yeah, 10 and 2, I, I understand where it's coming from. I just I, I saw the team up close last year. There's going to be changes. I get it. But to think they're going to win all the games they're supposed to win and not stumble at any point in those games, I that I can't I can't buy that. That's tough. I would be very surprised with 10 and 2. Pleasantly surprised, I should obviously point out, but very surprised at 10 and 2. I don't know where that came from. Because yeah. It ain't like they lost a bunch of coin flip games last year yeah. where they lost in the last seconds on a heartbreaker. They lost one of those games. The other six, they were just dominated. So it's odd to me to think that they're going to be that much better. But then again, people make jumps in year two, and they do have an easier schedule. And nope, they only have one sure loss on the schedule. But that's why I think eight and four, nine and three is more realistic because you can't assume they're going to win every game they should win. Because yeah. that that's college football. That Never just happens. doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to anybody. General. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Maxwell says, by the way, we all thought Cabin Gelly and Man playing with Kawhi would be cool, but freaking Paul George too? Wow. On that note, basketball. Which former Noel in the NBA do you believe will go down with having the best NBA career? I really think that it could end up being Cabin Gelly, especially if he is taken under his wing by Kawhi and Paul George. Well, I mean, I don't know how long they're all going to be playing together. I think they, well, Kawhi only signed a three-year deal because he's going to be eligible for the Supermax after that, in which case he can become a billionaire or whatever it's going to be by that time. Uh, I don't know. I haven't watched a lot about I – I haven't watched a lot of Magic basketball, but I do listen to the Rosillo show, and I defer most of my basketball opinions to Rosillo, and he seems to have a good feeling about Jonathan Isaac at some point. I mean, like, everything is there. Like, will it all come together is obviously the, the, the burning question. Uh, he's obviously the highest drafted guy, so that's sort of the, the lazy layup answer. But I, I think either him or Cabin Gelly, just because we, we saw how good Cabin Gelly is, and he's just so raw. Like, I mean, 
what are the chances that we're going to look back in three, four years and, and just kind of marvel at, man, imagine if we would have had him for one more year. It just feels like that's what's going to happen. Maybe yeah, I mean, there's definitely a chance Isaac. that's going to happen. I, but I do think the answer there is Isaac. I think uh, he he had some really big moments this year for them. He's it's a weird deal because he's you know he was their lottery pick, but even still, this second year in the league, which was kind of really his first because he didn't play a lot as a rookie because he got hurt, he was like their fourth option. Like they just didn't run anything for him. He didn't get the ball a ton. Um, the I can't remember their names. They're they're they both have weird names. Fournier maybe and. Yeah. Vucevic. Yes, correct. They Look at you. Time. Look nope. at you, man. Just pull him out. Go with Just it. Nailed it. Nailed it. They don't pass a lot. So, Isaac, I want to see what Isaac looks like as the number one or the number two option because I think he has a chance to be an all-star, like a perennial all-star because he he is obviously t- he's tall. He can shoot. He's quick. He's got the quickness of a guard. He's really good on the defensive end or can be um, as a, you know, whatever he is, 20 or 21. I think that guy has a chance to be a perennial all-star. If he gets in the right situation, that doesn't mean leave, leaving teams, but get different personnel around him or become more of a factor where they where they run stuff for him. Because I watch enough Magic games to see, I mean, they don't run a lot. of. He's shooting like seven times a game. The other guys were shooting 19. Like, that needs to be reversed. In my opinion, that needs to be reversed. So you see what Jonathan Isaac is. They compared him Durant to Durant coming out of high school. Now, no... That's a, I mean, Durant's one of the top 10 players that's ever played probably or will end up that way. He's not going to be Durant necessarily, but he's got all the tools to be a really good player. And it's like the magic, he's like an afterthought. Like he just, he, you know, he'd he get seven shots a game. I want to see what he looks like as the number one or number two option. That'll happen at some point in his career. And he will end up being, in my, he's going to end up being the second best FSU basketball player ever in the NBA. Boom. Cleve Dog, FSU 22, Corey Aslan. Wake up. I first heard about War Chant, and obviously at the top of the thread, I ask everybody to give us the story of how they first discovered War Chant. Maxwell already gave us a story. He literally typed in warchant.com one day. Right. Weirdo. Uh, just kidding. Love you, big guy. Uh, Cleve Dog, FSU 22, discovered War Chant from my son about a year or so ago. We were both diehard seminal fans. By the way, I love the show, especially the quick wit humor that you two display. Check is in the mail. I tried over and over again to find more information about FSU recruiting and the state of athletics until I found War Champ. I've been an FSU fan since the days of Ron Simmons, not to give my age away. With 52 days and counting until kickoff, he posted this on Tuesday. It's now thir- it, we're Really? We're like under 50 days to kickoff? That seems about right, right? In the, almost in the middle of July. Man, life moves fast. 52 days and counting until kickoff. I predict that our Seminoles will go 12-0 and or 11-1 and this season. Remember, wow. you heard it here first. All right, Khalif, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, let's go. Primetime 92. What up, Kazlon? He spelled it C-A-S-L-O-N. So it's like a you know amalgamation of Corey Hey, Aslan. so that guy's name was Cleve Dog? Cleve Dog, FSU one? 22. Yeah. I want him to – he's going to listen to this, I hope. I want him to tell us what the where that name comes from. Is okay. he from Cleveland, Ohio, and he's part of the Dog Pound? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, that's, what I'm, yeah that's what I'm curious yeah. about. Where right. where did the Cleve Dog come from? Because Stephanie, um, the lovely Stephanie, it went to Cleveland Browns games as a kid. So I want to know if Cleve Dog – maybe he's from Cleveland, Georgia. I don't know. I, see, I think there's a Cleveland, Georgia. Or uh, maybe Cleveland, he's from Mississippi. Cleveland, Ohio. I just want to know where that name came from. Yeah. There's a Cleveland, so Mississippi dog, you're listening. Well. Yeah. Write in and let us know next week. Okay, boom. Uh, Primetime 92. What up, Caslon? I first discovered War Chant in elementary school when Drew mm. Weatherford and Xavier Lee were in the recruiting class. What a dynamic duo. My question is, what is your funniest slash craziest moment from your college years? Thanks, as always, for entertaining me from my boring work day. Man. Wow, that's a that's a. Well, you already told that crazy, crazy six part Notre Dame story. Yeah, that's up there. Um, I'm at good spring break times. I mean, most of mine are like things that I really don't want to. I'm not trying to. I mean, yeah, most of them like involve crime, like getting in violent fights. It's not like you know, funniest. I fell on a girl. I tripped off a bus yeah. at UGA. I was getting off the bus, and and in my defense, you're supposed. It's like the the etiquette of the elevator. Like get out of the way and let the people get off the elevator. And then you get on. Don't stand there right in front of them. Right, right. Well, she, for whatever reason, she was standing right in front of the bus steps. Ooh. 
And, and uh, not that this really matters, but she was a bigger girl. Okay. And I'm going down and I trip because, of course, I do. Like my ankle twists. It was really crazy. And I fall with all my weight, like oh. like a sack of potatoes, and tackle her. Straight up tackle her right by the bus stop. Um, she was not happy with me. I'm not I, I think she understood that I tripped, but I don't know for sure. She might have thought I just jumped off the top step of the bus and intentionally tackled her. But uh yeah, that was that was a fun I actually twisted my ankle bad enough that I couldn't play in the uh intramural basketball game that late, later that day, which was a which was a disappointment. But uh yeah, that was uh people laughed that saw it. It wasn't really funny for me. But yeah, walking off the bus, that's the most embarrassing moment of all time. This lady, this woman, uh you whatever, sophomore, junior in college. Um, she cushioned the fall. I don't say that to be rude. Oh, Corey, but come on. she landed with all the brunt. Like she took the brunt of it. I landed on her. She's the one that landed on the pavement with authority. Cause I was coming from three feet up, like in the air on the bus, the top of the bus step. I tripped with all in like, you know, you, you're tripping down steps. There's not much you can do. The, the, the gravity is already working against you. And I just pummeled her. I apologized profusely, but she didn't want to hear it. And she also didn't get on the bus, uh, which I also thought was weird. It's like you were that you, you were that uh, in that much of a rush to get on the bus that you didn't give me a chance. You didn't give me a space to fall because you're standing there. But then uh, you don't even get on the bus. She just was like, whatever, and walked off. Anyway, um, there you go. That's, that's college for you yeah. young listeners. If you're listening yeah. to this, that's. That's what college is all about. Oh, here is my call. Here it is. This is the craziest one, and um, it's bizarre. I'll try to make it as quick as possible because we got a whole bunch of questions. We went to a party off Honeysuckle and Ocala, which is across from what used to be called the Players Club apartment complex, and I think it's being reborn and called the Players Club again. Anyhow, it was some girls we went to high school with. They had a keg party. This was like our junior, senior year of college, so we were kind of older and wrapping things up, and I just wasn't feeling it that night, so my roommate and I, we left. Uh, there was three of us that lived together. Us two left. All my other bu- buddies were still at the party. They stuck around. And then like an hour and a half later, we get this frantic call from one of our friends like, dude, go to TMH. Uh, John's in trouble. Go to TMH. And we're like, whatever. Apparently, like 30 minutes after we left, the party was pretty much getting done. Everybody was leaving. And people were kind of in the middle of the road walking to their cars or talking as they were leaving. And my buddy and a couple of my other friends were in the middle of the road talking and a car pulled up and started hitting the horn. It was like, hey, y'all move out of the way. And everybody's drunk and like, dude, who are you? Uh, screw you. And then the guy kind of tried to drive through and, and, and kind of push the traffic away with his car. Well, this one kid apparently threw a beer at the car and started walking away. Well, the guy gets out of his car and literally pulls out a machete Whoa. and goes at my friend who didn't throw the beer at him. And literally hits my friend across the forehead with a machete. And then all hell breaks loose. Uh, his girlfriend starts crying out. My buddy who gets in the, with the machete because he's covered in blood apparently at this point. That guy gets mauled by two of my friends. Gets up, runs across the street. Like crosses Ocala Street, which is a very busy street. Four of my friends chase him. Uh, proceed to pummel him badly. And then we all rendezvous at the hospital and literally we park next to my friend's girlfriend's car that it just, it looked like she hit three deer. It was that covered in blood. Uh, he lived, he's fine. He's got three healthy children, two born, one on the way, one adopted, a beautiful wife, uh, is doing fantastic in life. And then the crazy thing is my four friends who ran across the street and pummeled that guy, they all got arrested and charged and had to pay restitution to that kid. The kid who hit my friend in the head with the machete got off with it. Didn't have to do anything. Didn't get charged with a crime. Didn't have to pay for my buddy's medical bills. Nothing. I think he pulled the hole. He was scared. He was intimidated. Like he felt his life was in danger. Well, oh, get, he he, get he in the car and leave. Machete. Get in the car and leave. Yeah. That's one option. Or just start swinging a machete and see what Gee, happens. I mean, it's crazy. My buddy still has a scar across his head. AKB 72. Yeah, those machetes aren't to be trifled with. <sighs> AKB 726. Wake up! I first subscribed to War Chant when the Jimbo saga began. From the start, I asked myself, why didn't I subscribe sooner? I know. I spent weeks reading past threads from years back. 
Love what Corey, Michael, Ira, Gene, and you bring us each and every week. Always a bonus, though, with Cameron as well. Mm -hmm. One question, guys. I've noticed through Jimbo's years, specifically the later ones, blue chip players would shine their first year only to disappear year two and three. Of course, there are exceptions. Ramsey, Derwin, Cook. Just seems from a scheme and technique standpoint, the past staff limited the development at times. What are your thoughts on our new staff's ability to develop our young men coming in last year and this year's cycle? Thanks for all your time and efforts, fellas. Scalp them. Well, I don't. I would. Uh, I, don't I would know. like to see what Willie does with a bunch of five well, stars who dropped yeah. off. Like who? Who was good freshman year for Jimbo and then went? Yeah, I don't know. I was trying to. Jimbo. I was trying to think about that myself. I. Uh, I know Rashad was, but he wasn't really a five star. But he was much better as a freshman than he was as a sophomore. But then he turned into Rashad Green mm-hmm. as a junior and senior was awesome. So um, I Maybe don't know. Like EJ, I was did we he not would tell me? Did we not think EJ like Max? I mean, EJ improved year over year. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I think EJ got everybody excited in 09 and even the uh, the times he stepped in in 2010. That was a lot to get excited about. Like, oh, man, he's going to be awesome. Right. And it never right. really materialized into awesome. Yeah. It was just, you know, good to pretty good. Yeah. Um, so like maybe that. Yeah, it didn't regress, though, but I, I get it. Well, we'll see. I, I think as his top 10 starts getting unveiled, I'm curious to see where Keyshawn. I feel like Keyshawn Helton, for some reason, is such a is such a litmus test for Willie, just in terms of, of talent evaluation and, and development, because, again, that's a guy that didn't have a lot of offers. Willie kind of last minute you know, asks around, is told, check this kid out and decides to offer him after looking at the tape. And, uh, you know, I think that goes into a long way into letting us know just how good of an eye he has for talent evaluation because he, he tells everybody, basically, he looked at the the guy, the coach told him, check this kid out at a neighboring high school. He looked at Keyshawn Helton, uh, his tape, and was like, yeah, man, he's legit. Let me offer him. So if, if he were to be the guy, I think it's like what, either him or DJ, one of them is going to be that sort of, you know, Baylor prototype, Bryles prototype, shifty slot receiver guy. Maybe there's enough room for both of them. But I think if like if you see Keyshawn maybe emerge as the number two receiver this year, that's that's a really good sign that that Willie knows you know what he wants and and is able to to get the right kind of guy into his his system, the Bryles system. Yeah, but haven't we already seen enough from Keyshawn, even in the limited stuff we saw as a freshman, to know that yeah, man, he could definitely play at this level. At a high level. I don't know about that. I mean, come on. Oh, I mean, I think he's a guy that you could put in the backfield. I think he's a guy you'd run with reverses. But he's a guy that may – I mean, I just think he's a guy that, you know, what we've seen, the limited stuff we've seen, and I know it was against Clemson's second-string defense, but even that one. Yeah. There weren't a lot of Florida State guys that were making moves like that and scoring from 70 yards away. Right. Like, he's obviously proven he's better than, like, UAB. Right. Or whoever right. else was recruiting him. Yeah. Now, is he going to be the next Rashad Green? Yeah, man, I, I don't know about that. But I think he's already proven that Willie Willie didn't make a mistake by offering him, I should say, I guess. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, I think that's what we want to see. Uh, A.S. Dillon, 89. Wake up. He did it. Two exclamation marks, though. Wake up! Shane from Virginia. I first discovered War Chant 2009 after Ponder tried three straight passes to Jamar Fortson and ended up losing what would be Bowden's last game against Miami. Mm-hmm. I used to read the free articles in college, but I've been a subscriber for several years now. My question, if FSU goes 9-3 and three, but loses to Clemson, Miami, and Florida, would this season be considered a failure? I personally believe that without at least one win against the rivals, the fan base will continue to doubt Taggart and call for his whistle. Thoughts? Well, first off, I think I like how you said call for his whistle. I thought that was clever. That is clever. That's like a that. lot better than uh, maybe call for his visor. Right, right. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I like that. But instead of call for his job, call for his whistle. That's yeah. good stuff. Well, it depends how it all depends how it looks. But I, I know you're, you're throwing hypothetical. You can't. Nine and no, three no, no, and no, you no, lose no. to those. It, yeah, it, you take it. That's good. That's good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Clemson, there's, Clemson's there's a good no team. Debate. Yeah, really, in my opinion, I know people would be disappointed if they lost all three of those teams. Well, they did it last year, too. <laughs> but if they won all the other games, yeah, it went nine and three and have a chance to play for a bowl to go to 10 and three after five and seven. I mean, yeah, you could nitpick and say, well, that's a bummer. We Number one, you're not beating Clemson. So, you know what I mean? Like that, that's not something we're even debating right now. So it be- definitely comes down. It basically comes down to Florida and Miami and 
you know, if you lose a couple of close games, or even if they're blowouts, but you win every other game, man, that is a huge step in the right direction. Now, you want to get that turned around quickly where you're not, you never want to be okay with losing to your rivals. But when you're coming off five and seven, any wins are valuable. So, yeah, I think nine and three with a chance to get to 10 wins in season two after what we saw last year, I, I think Florida State, some Florida State fans, sure, like we talked about 20 minutes ago, will not be happy with Willie Taggart. But most fans will be very happy, even with a nine and three, even with those losses to those three teams. If you win the other nine games, that means wins over Boise State and Virginia on the road. I mean, those are, you know, you can't, you can't dismiss those after what we've seen the last two years. Hey, can I say something that'll make everybody angry? I, I can't wait. Uh, Marlon from Miami, if you're listening, earmuffs. I'm going to go ahead and say you beat Boy- beating Boise is more important than beating Miami this year. I don't know if you – I think if you lose to Boise, there's so much bad feelings and angst that will come that I don't think I – don't, I don't even know if beating Miami will, will keep you warm at night because I think this, the, the, the season will feel – like a drag if you lose that opener. I know you want to beat Miami, everybody. I would like to beat Miami, too. Uh, I might not even believe what I'm saying, but I just want to give us something to talk yeah, about. Yeah, you don't believe that. What you're, what you're saying, and I get it, is if you lose to Boise to start the season. You give up on the whole year. Really, you give up on the whole Taggart year. Taggart is 5-8 and eight Yeah, to start, his, to start his tenure. All the momentum is just flushed down the drain. There might be 11,000 people at that next game. But there will be people at the Miami game. And if you end up going eight and four, nine and three, and you lose to Boise State, but you beat Miami, I'm prom- I'm telling you, people yeah, would be much yeah. happier with the nine and three with a win over boy win over Miami than a nine and three with a win over Boise. Okay. But yeah. we're looking at it, you're looking at it just in the in the short term, which I get. Everybody gosh. will be drained, oh and it'll gosh. be tough to write about, and it'll be tough to talk about if they lose to Boise. Because holy moly, oh, what are we doing gosh. again with this? But if they turn it around to the point where they can beat Manny Diaz in his first year and all that quote unquote momentum that he's got down there and you go and beat him and you end up getting eight or nine wins and one of those wins is over your rival, man, that that's a much bigger deal than than uh, beating Boise State. I, it's the most important non sure but that's just post-game. for the momentum of the season. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, turn it around. Yeah, yeah. If they can turn it around after losing to Boise and still manage a good year with a win over Miami, by November, people won't care that much about Boise. But I think we look at it through the prism of, man, if they lose to Boise, they might go 4-8. and eight. The wheels might completely come off. Certainly the fan base will be done for, for the short term, yeah. but the wheels might completely come off. But if they don't, if they stay intact and they end up winning eight or nine games and beating Miami – then that went over. Then that loss to Boise won't be nearly as big a deal as we think it would. We think it is at the time. Yeah. Our thought, our worry is they won't rebound. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Well, then it'll just sit it, them down a huge hole. I would. In that argument, I was trying to make. I wasn't implying that, but that would be the real life ramifications that you would fear. Right. I got to go back and look at. And this is it's so weird to talk about, but like I, I have to almost go back and look at Bryles. Kendall Browse's career more so now than looking at anything Willie's done. Like, to see if they ever went in the tank in a season. Like, I know Baylor was bad, but they eventually got Baylor good, and they never really slipped too far off the pace they set for themselves. Then he was at FAU for one year. I think they won 10 games that season. Um, I mean, Houston still won, like, what, eight or nine games last year? So yeah, it, it'd least, be, yeah. it'd be cr- it's just crazy to think that even if they were to lose to Boise, that – like Kendall Browse wouldn't figure out a way to get this offense back on track to start scoring enough points. And as pessimistic as I am about the defense, they, I mean, there's no way they're going to go and get rolled on for, you know, 38 points every single week too. So, um, you know, anywho. Uh, FSU Todd, that was a terrible segue, but we got to move on. It's past 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. It is. Good morning from Panama City, waiting for Zaxby's to open. I don't know if he actually is, is like, outside of an actual Zaxby's in the morning waiting for it to open or is he waiting for one to be built? Well, either way, we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, recommend just sitting outside an empty Zaxby's parking lot at like 2 in the morning. Yeah. But anyhow, thanks like, for hanging let, out. Let them talk. open up like or get there right when they're opening up. Uh, but don't don't wait there in the middle of the night. That's not good news for anyone. Question number one, with Ron Dugan's coaching him, 
Is this season Gavin's best chance to show he can play on Sunday? Well, it's the last chance, right? He's it's his last chance, yeah. but I also think it is his best chance. You know, I, I do think that this is by far the best coach he's had. You know, we talked about it on headlines this week, uh, Seminole headlines. Uh, obviously, folks, you need to listen to that, too. They listen to headlines. Wake Up War Champ first. If you have any extra time in your week, go to Seminole headlines. The Irish Ophel oh, is on there, Jeff you know, Cameron. I, I mean, that was um, nice of you. But, you know, Ira brought up, like, this is by far the best coach any of these guys have had. And Lawrence Dossie was a great Seminole, was actually the coach on a was a coach on a national championship team. But when you look at his track record for 10 years, and you look at the fact that Jimbo didn't take him with him, and you look at the fact that he still doesn't have a job, he might not have been the best receivers coach there was out there. Ron Dugans is a very good receivers coach. And I just think that these guys are all going to get better coach. And obviously, David Kelly hadn't been doing it for a decade, didn't really want to do it, was kind of talked into it. So this is, with Ron Dugans, this is the best guy they've had. This is the best guy that Keith Gavin's had. And holy moly, he's got all the talent, man. He's just got all the talent. I talked about it last last year, um, but during one of the fall practices that we were able to attend, maybe it was the spring. I think it was the fall, though. Um one of the NFL scouts was walking around and he asked me, he's like, is 89 a receiver or a tight end? And I go, he's a receiver. And he go, and I think he asked me if he could run. I go, yeah, he's actually one of the faster guys on the team. And he goes, man, that's how they draw him up. You know, this is an NFL scout talking about Keith Gavin's body. Like he's got the measurables and he's got the talent. He's certainly got the speed and the measurables that he should be a difference maker. And he just hasn't been, you know, he's just been okay. What does he have? Does he have a touchdown catch in his career? Gosh, I don't think so. Maybe one. Um, his biggest play is still a, re- a kick return as a freshman. That's the biggest play he's made as a Florida State Seminole. They can never that, take that, that away from change. Yeah. And uh, he's got the he's got everything that you'd want. He's got one he, touchdown. He's, he's still here. He caught a touchdown against Miami this past year. That's his first career touchdown pass. He did. I don't even remember that. I don't either. I don't he caught a touchdown. He caught a touchdown. There you go, Keith Gavin. <laughs> there you go. Save it for the Canes. But anyway, um, he, that's a guy that, yeah. First touchdown of the game. Be, he needs to be good. Really good. You know you what you got in 15, and we both think 29 and 20 are both good players. 88's a good player. But, man, <laughs> Keith Gavin, they don't. They, there aren't many teams that have those kind of guys. In the red zone, first down. Taking a shot up the seam, bobbled, caught at the goal line. It's a touchdown to DJ Matthews. Or check that Keith Gavin. If oh. <laughs> Even Bob with Susan wasn't ready for that. My man, my man finally catches a touchdown and he's identified wrongly as DJ Matthews. Oh, man. I get it, though. That It's the nine. The, the second number is the nine for both yeah. of them. But, yeah, Keith Gavin has a chance, man. This is his last year. It's obviously his best. It's only it's his last chance. Should be his best chance. And you got to hope Dugan's worked some magic with that guy because he's got some talent inside him. The crazy thing is he got, like, tackled on the half-yard line, but he fell on the Miami guy, so he rolled over the plane to, to get the touchdown. But That's Keith Gavin, baby. Just, keep, just earn it, man. He earn smells it. the end zone. Earn it. Uh, his second question is, Aslan, can we get a dating life update? Thanks for the great work, Coracle and Asman. Yeah, Aslan, can we get a dating life update? What, how are uh, we doing? We're not doing good, man. This is not, it's not good. Uh, I'm trying to be more deliberate on what I'm doing. I just kind of was mm-hmm. a, a, a mess for the last few months. I, mean, I still am a mess. This is the problem. I'm pretty sure, like, I love her, or I loved her now. In hindsight, it doesn't really matter anymore. But the, the problem is you should probably, kids, if you're listening to this, like, try to fall in love when you're 18 or 19 because it probably won't work out. And then you have, like, two years you can just drink and be crazy and then work yourself through the problems. Or actually, wait till you're like 21, and then you can break up and then drink legally. Because um, yeah, I'm gonna have to like I'm gonna have to like be 39 maybe when I'm back on my feet and ready to do this. Your boy's not doing well, everybody. I mean, I'm okay. I'm not gonna do anything crazy or rash to my life. I'll be here because uh, I love hanging out with y'all. So yeah, yeah, things aren't going good for me, but uh, keep your fingers crossed. I think it's the summer of love. I historically do well summertime odd numbered years. And there's a couple girls in the Bumble queue that are relationship quality. Uh, so stay tuned. I'm trying, 
But yeah, like, what do I do, guys? What do I do? I hurt, man. I hurt. But, you know, life goes on. Such is life. Captain D underscore 63. Good morning, Aslan. Good morning, Corey. I joined Warchant in 2003. I joined the family. I heard about Warchant.com when Gene was doing recruiting back in the late 90s and early 2000s on a radio show once a week. I have never regretted being a Warchant subscriber. Why would you? I can't imagine at any point you're like, I can't believe I just spent $9.99 for 30 right. days of hanging out with Ira and Corey and Michael Langston and Gene and Aslan. Like how can I just it doesn't compute. Kind of like why she won't take me back. It seems we have too many guys underachieve here at Florida State. Even goes back to that other coach. Most of these players are four and five star recruits. Why does it take a player to come into his own in his junior year of college? Is it coaching? Is it the player not putting in the work? Or is it poor evaluation of guys coming out of high school? Always love the show, guys. Looking forward to the articles, videos, and interviews of the ACC kickoff next week. Go Knowles. I think I've answered every question, I think, first. You want to take this one first, Corey? I mean, all right, I I'll do it. say that for all of the guys. Obviously, there, there are some exceptions, like a Jalen Ramsey or Derwin James. They were awesome right away. Timmy Jernigan, Rashad Green. Um, I just think a lot of it, man, is maturity. That's, that's yeah. kind of how it works. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, you can't expect – you don't typically expect freshmen to come in and be great right away or even – contributors really and if you have too many freshmen contributing right away well you don't have a great program you know that's just you get bigger you get stronger you get smarter you start to take things more seriously knowing that your college career is winding down and if you want to make a living at this you better get your act together I think all that happens um you know sophomore junior years is when that starts happening and I think that's just kind of always been the way I mean remember Florida State forever didn't even start a quarterback until they were redshirt junior and so they were, they'd been on campus for four years. So I don't think it's like that anymore. I think guys are contributing earlier because they're bigger and stronger and they're more prepared, but not that much more. Like Timmy Jernigan was eight years ago now that he was a freshman. Um, so not that long ago. He's a rare breed. They don't, you don't get guys on the defensive line that contribute early as freshmen, typically. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that. I, 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 I wouldn't say that's a negative towards Jimbo that guys didn't contribute to later in their careers I just kind of think that's how it works in college football I think it falls more on players I, not all four five-star kids are created equally as we all know I mean they, they, some come from different programs uh, you know evaluation you can talk about as much being coaches as it is rivals.com evaluators maybe not really being able to size up the competition of kids going against that ran for 1,900 yards and 36 touchdowns. Maybe that kid really isn't as good as his tape showed to be. So I don't know, you know, that really doesn't fall on a coaching staff. Maybe they should be able to, they should be able to look at it a little bit better. I, I get that. But in terms of why a four or five star doesn't uh, sort of pan out. But, you know, some guys come from really good programs that have really good strength programs that really simulate what, you know, college programs are going to be like. I think Madison High School is a really good example. That's why I think a lot of folks are uh, pretty high on Travis Jay because, uh, Madison works pretty close hand in hand with whoever's going to be the head coach at Florida State to implement stuff at their practices to make it as tough and grueling and as, as college ready as possible. Uh, you know, just because you played ball in Georgia doesn't necessarily mean your 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 school has got the the best coaching staff or the best resources and and has set you up for things. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of sort of entitlement and you know maybe you think it's going to be a little bit easier than it really is. You're, you only it, it takes a lot to be a 19 year old, 18 year old kid. I mean, just think about having a fake ID and being 18 and walking into Bullwinkle is a place that's mainly 21 and up and not feeling weird. I mean, that's kind of a weird example, but I mean, just try to imagine being an 18 year old kid and having to go up against 21 year old, 22 year old guys that have been playing for three years, have been in the strength program for three years. Like you have to have a certain mindset to be able to compete and not even so much physical development, but you need to have like a, a mental mindset uh, to be able to, to hang with kids like that. And it's going to take time for some guys. Not everyone's got that quote, dog in him we True, haven't said buddy. that hey so do you like bumble better than tinder i think so the thing is um i restarted my my uh my bumble or whatever and so it's like a, a fresh new world i don't think anyone uses i think tinder is almost i don't know i think tinder is uh has like the scarlet letter on it now 
I feel like it's like it's it's just like a joke or it's nothing serious. Like on Bumble, you can you know it's more serious. You can you can develop into something more than just going to the batting cages, um, which is what I want, man. You know, your guy, your guy got hurt, man. He's got to get back on the horse. I mean, uh, that was like, but we're looking at like know. six months ago I now, know. right? Yeah, pretty much. And all I only right, dated for like right. seven. Months. You know what? It is time to get back on the horse. It's been six months, buddy. <sighs> I can't. You're Aslan. It doesn't matter. You're a big I deal. My, I lost my mojo. It's all over. You're a big deal. Uh, let's take a question from a caller. 850-792-5730. Wake up. This is Dane from Orlando. Uh, love the show. First time caller. Uh, just wanted to ask. There's a lot of talk about playing a 3-4 defense, but we've always had question at linebacker. Has anyone ever considered us playing a 5-1-5 and just put all our great defensive linemen and DBs on the field and just finding ourselves one good linebacker? Thanks for the call. Dane, I mean, you know, listen, uh, why not do something radical? Did you see this tweet I, I put out there, Corey? And, I, and I'm trying to be somewhat serious here now. Mississippi State's head football coach, Joe Moorhead, had a chalk talk for local media. He literally brought local media in and put up the playbook, like literally put a play on the projector that they're going to run and describe the whole RPO concept behind it, the run-pass option, what they're looking for. Like It was only like a 10-second clip because he didn't, you know, obviously I think the, the media wasn't supposed to like show everything going on. But how cool would that be if Kendall Browse was like, check it out, this is what we're trying to do. Because, like, you know, I'd be – someone would be afraid, like, right, like, Harlan, like, why just – like, why not do, like, a 515? Like, make the guys kind of hybrid-ish? Everybody's a hybrid nowadays. I'd be like, what – like, think about it. If you did a 515, like, what are you going to attack? If you just run a, a, a simple, like, you know, I don't know, 13 personnel. Like, you know, one back, uh, three receivers. You know, like, what – if you see only one linebacker out there, you're just going to run a bunch of crossing routes and just eat them I mean, alive. I feel like you would you would try to take it. You would try to exploit the middle of the field, uh, maybe with a five-one-five. But you know what's weird about that? And you, and I know he was doing it in jest, and it was uh, meant to be humorous. But it kind of like so. Who are going to be with if they run a three-four? The two outside guys are going to be who? Nashville Dean and Woodby, probably. I would think so. Yeah. Maybe Lars Woodby. Well, they're going to be a lot. They're, they're going to have two outside guys near the line of scrimmage anyway. A good per, percentage of the time, I would think. So that kind of looks like a five-man front anyway. I know it isn't. You don't have five defensive linemen, but you have five guys around the line of scrimmage, and then you also have like you know Nashville Dean or Lars would be both of them probably won't rush. So one of them will drop back and be a a safety playing linebacker. So we talk about. Um, you know, wanting to get your best, your all your DBs on the field. Well, two of them will be on the field, but they'll probably be in a quote unquote linebacker position. So, you know, I know they're not going to run a, a five. I don't know if a five one five's ever been run. Um, why not like a, just a five six? Let's just call it a five six. Well, yeah, um, people thought and just it was eliminate the linebacker position, but I, I, it's the way the game is played now. They really, they're everybody is a hybrid. Like, you're going to have three or four hybrids on every defense that's any good. Guys that could line up and rush the passer are back up into coverage. Are guys that are technically safety, are, you know, technically linebackers, but are really safety types. Like a DeKalen Brooks or a Nashville Dean or a Lars Woodby. Like, you know, that's just the athletes that you're going to have on the field now because the game is so different. It ain't the 80s, man. We can't just straight up four threes with the other team, with the offense and a power eye look, that just, nobody sees that anymore. How many teams does Florida State play that runs eye formation or like a normal, quote-unquote, pro set? Boston, Boston College? College? Probably, yeah. That it? That's it, right? Yeah, I think so. Like, I, all NC State did was was three and four wides, and, and same with Louisville and everything. So, yeah, man, it's just so... You know, it's weird that we're going to... we They're not really traditional four threes and three fours anyway. It's a bunch... Um, it's an amalgamation, Aslan. The amoeba defense, sure, Dick LeBeau. but it's an it's an amalgamation of a bunch of different parts and a, du- a bunch of different types of players. Where they're safeties, they're linebackers. What are they? You just need football players that can run and go make tackles. That's how, all I'm saying, Aslan. That's how, all I'm saying. How bad would you cringe 
if I ask Harlan, has he ever thought about doing a five one five? I mean, I would walk away from the interview. Now, if you did it jokingly, like with a smile on your face, somehow sometimes it's hard to tell if you're joking or not. Even when you're joking, you're so you're being so it seems like you're being so sarcastic or so serious that it's hard to pick up on. And if he thought you were being serious about a five one five, yeah, I might I might walk away. Just think about you could disrupt all the passing lanes just with your your five man front. I mean, you can rush three two guys, drop back zone kind of blitz look, you know, and you're you're disrupting the passing lanes. I mean, why not an eight three? Why well, can yeah well, yeah because it's not it's, that's not illegal. Just have three safeties and eight dudes at the line of scrimmage, oh, no. and you don't know all of them are standing up. Well, because just do a quick pass and then you break one tackle and it's over. You ain't breaking no tackles, son. They got four guys over on that side of the line of scrimmage on that side of the ball. You're not going to break all those tackles. You got eight guys at the line of scrimmage. Well, you run away. You were you run away from the side there. Well, you're not going to overload. Well, You'll be sure. four and hey, four. Man, try hey try to scheme it up. It's okay. impossible. Why? Not? That's the thing. <laughs> People thought that spread trying to play high school football in college was a crazy silly thing. Look how good it became. A lot of this is you have to be the brave. You have to be brave enough to go to the moon. Let's go to the moon, Dane. <laughs> I want to go to the moon. Mm-hmm. S.E. Baxley, 12-12. Two last questions. Well, this is a long one. Uh, wake up! I actually discovered Warchant.com after listening to Wake Up Warchant. That's the All way right. to do it. There you go. Uh, I was regularly listening to another podcast on FSU football and thought there has to be more FSU podcasts out there. Then I found the very entertaining Wake Up Warchant. Shortly after beginning to listen to Wake Up, I became a member. Been a member since March of 2018, so I guess I'm still a newbie. This is my second time posting, and it is. I can confirm. He's got two posts. Uh, this my this is my second time posting on the thread. My hometown being that of Dothan, Alabama, where I will be going before the city council next month with a motion to place a sign that acknowledges Dothan is the former residence of Aslan Hutchivandi. Damn right. Uh, my wife hardly pays attention to my rants and stories about FSU, but evidently I have spoken enough about you that she asked me when is she going to meet my friend from Iran. I just told her oh. that we only speak a couple times a week, and it's usually on the way to and from work, so we're not close enough friends to meet family. I can see FSU hitting its stride and winning 10 games a season, uh, SE Baxley 12-12 says. But I can also see FSU stumbling out the gates and looking just like last year and having to fight to win six games. Uh, You and all of us, brother. Uh, That's why I think right now the first game versus Boise is the biggest game. After that, Virginia has my curiosity. Is this a new team, new attitude, or is it going to be the same team we've seen over the last two seasons? So what do you guys think? Which game or games do you think will show if something has changed in the culture, or is it a continuation of the FSU football team that is 12 13 over its last two seasons, 12 and 13. Also, what is your on the fly quick go to Zaxby's meal? Mine is the big Zach snack. The Zach sauce is delicious. Love the show, guys. You have to meet and greet soon so that I can introduce my wife to my friend from Iran. Well, I'm not technically. That was a sweet message. It was. I'm, I'm technically not from Iran. I mean, my parents are. I am Iranian. I'm Persian. Um, but I'm not from Iran, but I can pretend. Hey, I'm man, from you're Iran. from Iran. Oh, 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 hey, easy white guy. Easy white guy. Don't don't don't, <laughs> Deal don't, with it. don't put the label on me. Uh, Boise. I mean, boy, it's crazy. I I almost would be like, Willie, I, I couldn't do this. You and you and Jane would fire me. Be like, freeze me out. Freeze me out the rest of the year. But I want to be able to cover everything Boise. The entire week, the bus ride to the stadium from the hotel, pregame, halftime, post game. Willie walking into his hotel at the end of the night. It, the ACC network, that needs to be the first, their first foray into hard knocks. And I'm being serious. Is Florida State's opener against Boise. You can put that against Clemson, defending champs, playing Georgia Tech on, on the network. But this game, they can lose it and still rebound maybe and win nine games maybe. I, I think it'd be hard to. It, it, I can't. It, it's all Boise, man. Everything... Everything hinges on Boise. Everything hinges on Boise. See, I, I I agree. It's a really big deal for the mood of the fan base, for the momentum, everything else. I get it. Um, but I feel like you got to look at those first three games and really the first and the third because the second one is uh, you, know, you got to win that game. So if you come out of the first three games two and one, 
No matter what the other one is, we know the one in the middle you're going to win. But if the second win is at Virginia or if it's at Jacksonville against Boise, I think the fan base after week three is in the same spot. You know what I mean? Like if you yeah. beat Boise 31-17 to 17 and then beat uh, Louisiana – is it Louisiana Monroe? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you beat Louisiana Monroe, so you're 2-0, and oh, and then you lose at Virginia? Well, you've lost the fans again to a certain extent. But if you lose to Boise and then beat Louisiana Monroe and then win at Virginia, I think – I mean, I kind of think – don't you think you're in the same spot? Like, just win one of those two. And I know it's Florida State. You can't be – it's odd what position we're in where I'm talking about, man, you just got to find a way to win, beat either Virginia or just, Boise State. Just split it, man. I just want to split Boise and Virginia and just I'll be split happy. The Boise, just split that gauntlet. You got that You got that Boise, <laughs> Louisiana, Monroe, Virginia gauntlet. You just got to figure out a way to only lose one of those. But that's kind of where you are when you're 12 and 13. If you can win at Virginia, that's as big. That's a big deal. That to me would trump losing to Boise, and it would get your fans back on board to a certain extent. Like, okay, they're showing improvements. That was a that was a nice win over a top twenty five ish team on the road. Good for you, Willie. I see what you're doing. I see some progress being made. I just think beating Boise is a big deal. If you lose to Boise, it's going to be a crushing blow to the start of the season, unless you beat Virginia, right? Then it's almost like everything's forgiven. Like, okay, you're two and one. We're yeah. feeling good about things. You just beat a good team, right? And it's and it's an ACC win. And as we right. know, the Atlantic is up for grabs. So, but you those two those weeks wins. before the like after oh. the Boise game and before oh. the Virginia win, oh. th- those would be awful. I get it, and that's the that's the nature of fandom, and that's the nature of a program at Florida State that is not used to losing. That if you're now five and eight in your first thirteen games at Florida State. That's that's tough to deal with. But if you can if you can rebound and beat Virginia, then I think the fan base is at least dipping their toe in the water again. Like okay, so anyway, that's that's my thought is you really need to be 2 and 1. No it'd be great if you're 3 and 0. Oh, and they could be 3 and 0. Oh. They might be favored. I don't think they'll be favored against Virginia. They might be. But it wouldn't be a stunner if they're 3 and 0. Oh. But as long as they're not 1 and 2, I think you're feeling at least sort of okay about things, right? What do, you right think, on? what do you think would be more likely? They go Boise, Monroe, Virginia, Louisville, NC State by week. So five games. So four and one, right? You're ecstatic. Of course. No matter what that one loss is, as long as it's yeah. not Louisiana Monroe. And even then, if you've beaten Boise and Virginia, you're like, all right, well, sure, okay. Um, yeah, if you're four and one going into your bye week, I, I, I again, if you lose to Boise – all though it's going to be a nuclear meltdown if you lose to Boise for two weeks. Gosh. But if you win those next four games, that nuclear meltdown is a is a uh, it's just a lost memory. People will be fired up again because you won four in a row. I'm crazy. I'm crazy. I've, I've admitted so much as much. We all know this. When I was a kid, there was literally times when I was like six years old, I would root for the hurricane to come out, come at us. I'm like, I want to feel it. Like, I want a hurricane to come hit my house. I want to experience this. I want to see what this is all about. Crazy. Like, Six- a, like a Miami hurricane? Or no, like no, no, a no, no, no. Absolutely. Like a, legit, like a, like a tropical cyclone. With, not like Alonzo Highsmith. Not that guy. A torrential a, downpour, damaging winds, life-altering, catastrophic disaster. Because okay. I'm six years old and I'm stupid. And I'm 36 and I'm not that much smarter. I <laughs> I don't Didn't want. You say you were thirty nine earlier. What was that about? I don't think I said I was thirty. Oh, I think I was like, I was talking about being in love and being in love earlier in life. That way, you can drink it out of your system and be all right. Whereas where I'm now, I'm not going to be emotionally mended until I'm thirty nine. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Sure. Yeah. I don't know if you'll ever be mended, buddy. Right. Uh, absolutely no. The the deviant in me. I just just like I. I would. I just kind of want to see what would happen if they lost to Boise. Like oh, I don't. I just said that out loud. I don't want it to. Ha- I don't want it to happen. But part of me is like, well, at least, like it's like you don't want the cops to show up when you're throwing a party when your family's out of town. But if they do show up, it's probably going to be like a good story. But no, this will be a heartbreaking story. I take it back. I don't want. I really don't want it to happen. But just like, don't you wonder? Like in the dark recesses of your mind that you don't talk about in front of your 15,000-plus listenership, mm-hmm. you don't agree. 
Uh, Sosa underscore ZP. I do not. No, I do not at all. I'm sorry. Wake up! Just wanted to point out that the San Diego fireworks show catastrophe you guys mentioned last week, I live on the water where they launch off the barge, maybe a half mile away. What a sight to see. But anyway, ACC kickoff coming soon, ready for the interviews. Hope Terry or Marvin take over a microphone like Jalen Ramsey did a few years ago. Also, I just want to tell you guys that this is the best damn FSU podcast there is. Far as quality content, humor, and a great team behind you guys. Couldn't ask for much else, except maybe a couple more guest speakers. LOL. Keep it up, fellas. We're almost there. Zaxby's Zach Salad for Life. Sosa out. Sosa, that was you you covered all the bases there, my man. I'm assuming a man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was that was perfect. We could have asked for anything better than that. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh previous listener asked about our go-to Zaxby's, and obviously I've said it before, but it's the cop sa- salad. Cop uh, salad. that stuff is legit. Um yeah, I, I, I guess how many how many interviews do you think we'll get up and I mean I think we'll get Marvin and uh, and Terry right but who else? Well, hopefully Willie. Well, yeah, the uh, those three hopefully will we we've built up enough goodwill that we'll get all three of those. But uh, you think there's any chance we get Dabo? We've asked. We'll try. I mean I don't know. We the thing is this we we put in this is behind the media curtain stuff that no one cares about people care about it, but Corey tells me not to talk about it because he says you guys don't care about it but I know you guys because I've been closer to you guys than he has right. he's been in the media longer than I have I haven't forgot who I am I haven't forgot who you are uh, we put us all in under one entity we're warchant dot com I should have at least been separate like I should apply for my own credential as wake up warchant an FSU podcast. Because then they would be like, oh, this dude is here just to talk for the radio. I'm not just like the video guy, reporter guy, hybrid guy, you know? So I think like when they're like, oh, they're a website for Florida State, we don't need to give them Dabo. But if it's like, hey, it's a radio station, radio show podcast, okay. But yeah, we're going to shoot for the moon out there. Maybe we'll ambush them. Maybe I'll just kind of, maybe we'll have some Zaxby's. We'll lay down a trap. Everybody loves the fingers. Maybe open some Zach sauce. Kind of put a fan in front of it. Maybe Corey can bring his box fan down from his hotel room. Put it in front of the Zach do? sauce. Waff, waff the flavor, the aroma of the Zach oh, sauce I to our you. table. I thought it meant more like like me whipping my hair with the fan blowing behind me. No, no, man. We don't have any hair on the show. I know. Well, not yeah. on the head. Anymore. No, we're gonna shoot from the moon out there for you guys because we're gonna we're gonna take the pretty much the entire week following off. So we'll probably try to throw together some of those mishmash interviews and um, let them ride out. There are a couple players. Like, I want to talk to uh, the backup quarterback from Syracuse, Tommy DeVito, who's now their starting quarterback, just to talk about the whole, like, you know, you prepare as you're going to be the starting quarterback. I think wasn't Dungy even hurt a little bit maybe going into the game against FSU last year? Yes. Anyhow, just like, what is it like when you actually do get called in the game like, are you freaked out? At what point do you settle in? How much of the game plan really does change? You'll hear coach like, oh, we didn't change the game plan. Just because he went out, it was next man up. It's like, are there a couple things in that playbook where you're like, I absolutely have no idea what that is, and I don't want to do it? Um, and just like, what is it like to be just some dude from Jersey and you beat Florida State as like a backup quarterback? Now, he's an elite 11 quarterback. He's a legitimate, talented guy. But I think we could have fun with that interview. Maybe they'll throw us that. But, yeah, we're going to try. We're going to try to do a whole lot of stuff up there uh, ancillary-wise to, to make this show better. But uh, Warchant.com will be killing it because Corey's going to be up there. Ira's going to be up there. Uh, and I'll be eating the free lunch downstairs and just, you know, sneaking up on Dabo. Be like, yo, no guts, no glory. Or all in. Or I brought my own microphone. Will you come sit down and talk to us? We about, guys... we about wrapped up tonight. We yeah. got anything else to That's it. Corey's done. I'm done. Thanks for listening. We'll catch up with you all next week. Have a great one, everybody. The universe is a big place, so you should feel especially lucky you ended up on the same planet with Zaxby's. And right now, we're cooking up our special Cajun Spice Black and Chicken for our Cajun Club Sandwich and Black and Blue Salad. It's an intergalactically delicious taste experience, and you don't have to travel light years to get it. The Cajun Club Sandwich and Black and Blue Salad, only at Zaxby's.